Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here. It's uh, always good to see your faces. Uh, hey, Jay, how are you doing? It's good to see you, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right back. Uh, welcome to the White House for your daily briefing. Uh, I have. A, I just want to make a, a brief uh, announcement, or not an announcement, just a reminder, because I know you all have seen this. But uh, today, the White House announced Summer Jobs Plus, which is a new call to action for businesses, nonprofits and government to work together to provide pathways to employment for low-income and disconnected youth in the summer of 2012. Already, 32 organizations and four federal agencies have come together to commit to creating nearly 180,000 employment opportunities for low-income youth uh, this summer, 70,000 of which are paid jobs or internships. The President proposed $1.5 billion, as I know you all know, for high-impact summer jobs and year-round employment for low-income youths. Uh, ages 16 to 24 in the American Jobs Act as part of the Pathways Back to Work Fund. When Congress failed to act, the federal government and private sector came together to commit to make that commitment that was announced today. The President has set a goal of reaching 250,000 employment opportunities by the start of summer, at least 100,000 of which will be placements in paid jobs and internships. Today's announcement is well on the way to meeting that goal, and we thank uh, the private sector participants in this. As you know, part of the President's approach to all of our economic challenges is to do everything he can, working with Congress on the important things we can do and must do legislatively, working through his executive authority, and working with the private sector uh, to keep uh, all of the energy of his administration focused on creating jobs and growing the economy. Uh, with that, I will uh, begin with the Associated Press, Ben Feller. Thanks, Jay. I wanted to ask you uh, first about the fallout from the recess appointments. Uh, I understand the White House's position on why it did what it did, but uh, in doing so, of course, you had to expect uh, that the Republicans would not be happy, and that's obviously putting it mildly, the reaction was, was pretty fierce. Um, I, I'm wondering how you think this will affect any other issues that you might seek to work on during the Congress. We will, as I just said, continue to work with Congress uh, on the issues that we have to address together. The President, any President, can't uh, put 400,000 teachers back to work by himself. He needs legislation. He needs Congress uh, to cooperate and do the things that they have done in the past in a bipartisan way to put those uh, uh, folks back in the classroom or to put construction workers back on the job building our infrastructure uh, or to do uh, any of a number uh, and a long list of things that uh, can and should be done through Congress, and he looks forward to working with Congress on that. Um, I know you know, Ben, that this President is hardly the first to make a recess appointment. In fact, he has made far fewer, far fewer as President this far in his term than either of his two predecessors, and that would include President George W. Bush. Uh, President Bush had made 61 recess appointments by this point in his term. Uh, by contrast, President Obama has only recess appointed 32 individuals now, including the four yesterday, 18 which, uh, of which, rather, have been uh, confirmed since. So uh, I, I certainly am aware of uh, some of the reaction that you uh, noted. The fact is the President firmly believes he has the constitutional authority to act as he did. And, and they can make a lot of process arguments about it. We feel very strongly that the Constitution and, and the legal case is uh, strongly on our side. But more importantly, this isn't about process. This isn't about whether or not uh, Congress uh, is in session. And uh, if I could digress for a minute, I think all of you should run up to Capitol Hill, check out uh, the House and Senate, and see if you can find a single member of Congress, and then tell me on this working day for most Americans whether or not Congress is in session. But what it's really about is the absolute urgency to install Richard Cordray as our consumer watchdog so that he can get to work today, as, he, uh, as the CFPB has already announced, protecting middle class Americans, protecting seniors from uh, dishonest non-bank mortgage brokers, uh, the kind who uh, took advantage of uh, that elderly, uh, elderly couple the President met with yesterday in Cleveland, or to help students uh, not get uh, taken advantage of uh, when they're dealing with their student loans or, uh, or, or uh, uh, folks who deal with payday lenders. I mean, the, we need, though, average Americans need somebody representing their interests in Washington. Uh, Lord knows that uh, financial institutions have 
armies of lobbyists here, uh, well paid, uh, looking out for them. The American people need Richard Cordray where he is now, thanks to the action the president took yesterday. But can't you see how it seems a little incongruous to continue to say that the president looks forward to working with them at the same time that he gives, you know, the, the statements that he did yesterday? I'm not going to take no for an answer. I'm not mm -hmm. going to have a lot of the ideological minorities stop me. Uh, then the, the response from the Republicans about it's a power grab, he's arrogant. It doesn't necessarily seem to lend itself to the next day. I look forward to working with them. Look, I, I don't think that uh, anybody expected or expects Washington to be, uh, you know, a campfire where everybody holds hands together and, and sings kumbaya. That's not what uh, the nation's business is about. Uh, as the president made clear when he was running for this office, uh, his number one priority was to ensure that when he became president, Washington stopped ignoring uh, some of the very difficult challenges that face the country. Uh, and he has taken uh, many of those on head on and has uh, uh, put in place solutions to some of those very serious challenges we face. And look, he, he has worked cooperatively with Congress from the moment he uh, took the oath of office and he will continue to do so. But the case here is pretty stark. Uh, the, Re the Republicans, unfortunately, in the Senate simply uh, refused to uh, allow Richard Cordray to have an up or down vote not for any uh, reason that had to do with his qualifications. Senator after senator, Republican, has said, this is nothing about Richard Cordray, he's very qualified. Republican attorneys general across the country have endorsed him. Uh, he, in the uh, cloture vote, he received a majority of the U.S. Senate. But the Republicans filibustered. Why? Because they don't even want the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau to be in operation. They certainly don't want it to have the powers that it has by law protecting American uh, citizens from uh, the kinds of practices that uh, helped lead to the worst financial crisis and the worst recession since the Great Depression. Uh, if they want to change the law, they should, going back to what we can do, or what they can do legislatively, they should try to pass a law to change it. But it is the law of the land, and, and it passed and it was signed into law by the President uh, because he is absolutely committed to the Wall Street reform uh, piece of this and to the uh, re reforms that uh, could not be implemented fully until Richard Cordray was in office, as he is today. One quick campaign question for you. Um, from the campaign side of President Obama's uh, apparatus, I guess you'd say, that the focus continues to be on uh, Mitt Romney. I'm wondering, does the president look at this as an open Republican race right now, or does he look at this as Mitt Romney to lose? You know, I, I, as I, th I think I said yesterday in the gaggle on Air Force One, the president and I had spoke briefly, just took note of the, the results from Iowa. I, he didn't make an assessment of, uh, you know, what, what's going to happen in the race or who he's going to run against. I think he knows from experience, uh, very personal experience, that uh, primaries can play out in a variety of different and unexpected ways. So he's focused right now, honestly, on, on his job. He doesn't have a primary uh, uh, to worry about, and, and, and that affords him the, uh, the luxury, if you will, but absolutely the importance of uh, continuing to focus on what he can do as president to grow the economy and create jobs, and, and as you heard him today, to, uh, to deal with our national security and our defense strategy. So. Um, you know, I, I, just talking, you know, idle conversations in the hallways, I think, you know, we, we, we know pretty much what you know, because we get it from you guys uh, in the press about uh, that process. It's, it's certainly interesting, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll pay attention to it as uh, folks on the sideline for now. But uh, I don't really have an assessment at this point as to uh, where it's going to head. And if I, you know, if I did know, I might make a trip out to Vegas. So, yes, sir. Also, on the, on the Cordray recess appointment, what, if any, concern does the White House have that uh, likely legal challenges to his appointment may, could, could undermine his ability to, to do his job, his legitimacy? Um, and um, how concerned if at all is the President that the Republicans could retaliate by withholding or by resisting compromise on things like extending the payroll tax cuts for the full year? or? perhaps even harden their opposition, their resistance to, uh, to, to further nominations? Well, uh, on the first point, I don't want to anticipate legal challenges that we haven't seen yet. And, and, 
and, and I uh, wouldn't be able to assess them uh, adequately since, as you know, I am not a lawyer. Uh, I can only say that we feel uh, very confident uh, about the legal foundation upon which uh, the President made this decision. Uh, and and I, I would just go back to what I said before about relations with Congress and uh, the fact that we have important business to do. And I would be surprised if Republicans wanted to argue that uh, even though the chambers are empty, even though many members of Congress have, de have described what they're on now as a recess, even though it's been made abundantly clear as a matter of public record that there is no intent for Congress to conduct any business until they return from this recess, uh, all of which plays into our argument that they're in recess, uh, in a sustained recess. Uh, you know, if they want to make that case and then, and then uh, because they're mad about that, not extend the payroll tax cut for the American people, well, that, that would be a shocker. Uh, I, I think that would be uh, very unfortunate uh, for the 160 million Americans who, uh, just as was the case in December uh, for January 1st, uh, could not afford and should not be saddled with uh, you know, what would be essentially a $1,000 tax hike uh, over frustration or peak with the fact that this president acted because Congress wouldn't on a very important job. The, 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 the installation of uh, a consumer watchdog whose sole responsibility, as you, you heard, I think you saw was announced today by the CFPB, is to, to make sure that average Americans are not taken advantage of by dishonest financial institutions. Uh, I think that uh, it, I, I don't, it's not a debate that we're hoping to have, but if we were to have it, I think we'd be confident we would win it. Are there any further recess appointments in the pipeline, or is this just a one-day flurry? <laughs> I have no, uh, no announcements to make about appointments or nominations today. Let me move uh, Chris. Thanks, Jay. Uh, the New Hampshire legislature this month is expected to vote on a bill that would repeal the same-sex marriage law there. Uh, the Democratic governor has said he'd veto any such measure that came to his desk, but the Republicans have a supermajority in, in the legislature, and they could potentially have the votes to override his veto. Both Rick Perry and Mitt Romney have said they support the repeal of the marriage law there, but what does the president hope is the outcome of this vote? I, Chris, I honestly haven't spoken to him about uh, you know, that state issue, uh, so I would have to take the question and see if there's anything I can get back the to you. The president has said that he, states, should, um, states should decide how to address the, best address the marriage issue themselves. Mm -hmm. if, the, if the legislature decides to repeal that uh, marriage law there, would he support that decision? Again, that's, a spec that's an if-if question, and, and I haven't had the conversation with him or uh, with any of the senior staff about it. So let me, let me take that and see if we can get a response to you. Yes, Julia. Uh, Senator Grassley says that he's going to write a letter to the uh, Department of Justice asking if President Obama got a new opinion before appointing Cordray. Did the White House talk to the Department of Justice, and if why won't they say whether they talked or not? Uh, the um, let me let me. I think I actually can say that you know we routinely consult with uh, the Department of Justice on a range of legal matters, uh, but we also routinely don't delve into uh, the specifics of any confidential legal legal guidance that the president. Uh, or the White House in general would receive uh, in in in, uh, in the course of those consultations. So, uh, I mean, I think that's just standard operating procedure. Uh, let me move around, Nora. Um, Jay, most Americans start the new year. They start a new diet or a new exercise regime or try and look at the new year as a fresh start. And the president Did you has see my list. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Start drinking less. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you found out this isn't water. <laughs> um, the president chose to start the new year with an intentionally provocative action, something completely unprecedented in appointing Richard Cordray. Why would he choose to start the new year by angering Republicans on Capitol Hill? Was this about politics? He chose to start the new year uh, with an action that is designed to take care of and protect average Americans who have to deal with these non-financial institutions. And, and because uh, of the way the law was written, 
the, the CFPB, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, could not implement uh, and effectively uh, oversee and uh, those non-financial, uh, non-bank financial institutions, uh, and therefore could not protect American citizens without having Richard Cordray in place. And as I just said, you know, unfortunately, Senate Republicans, as a matter of ideology and politics and just the sheer fact that they don't like Wall Street reform, I guess, or they don't want those protections in place for average Americans, refused to allow an up or, da- up or down vote on somebody who is broadly uh, acknowledged to be enormously qualified for the job, has uh, broad bipartisan support across the country, uh, and who even among those very Republicans who filibustered his uh, nomination uh, is viewed as uh, qualified f- for the post. They just don't want the post to exist in, in, in the way that it's written into the law. So. Uh, you know, he took action because uh, Congress wouldn't uh, on, a, on something that, uh, because every day he didn't have a consumer watchdog. Every day Richard Cordray uh, was uh, out there waiting for uh, or hoping for congressional Republicans or Senate Republicans to uh, choose protecting average Americans over uh, Wall Street and financial institutions and their lobbyists, uh, was a day when those, those Americans were not protected. So that's, that's why he acted. He didn't, he's, it, wasn't, it wasn't a deliberately provocative thing. It was a deliberately uh, decisive move to ensure that those protections could be in place and be implemented. And is the president now prepared um, for the reaction in terms of uh, what's coming from Republicans? I spoke with some yesterday who said that they have been working with the president, they approved all but two of his judicial nominees, they've approved a number of executive appointments, and that, quote, that's going to be very tough to do now. They view this as um, as provocative. President Obama has 74 nominees currently pending on the Senate floor. By contrast, at this time in 2003, President Bush had only 42 nominees pending on the floor. President Obama currently has a total of 181 nominees pending before the Senate. Those nominees have been pending before the Senate for an average of 165 days, or almost five and a half months. Uh, so while they certainly have approved a handful or some nominees, and there have been, uh, there has been, there have been ebbs and flows in that, that process, uh, the fact of the matter is we've had an unprecedented level of uh, obstruction when it comes to the confirmation, uh, often uh, confirmation of routine appointments and nominations. Uh, so that's uh, I take issue with that Thank supposition, you. and I would just say, look, the president looks forward to working with Congress, with Republicans in Congress as well as Democrats, on uh, the very important challenges that face the country, and the, and the challenges that uh, for which the solutions require congressional action. And and he, going back to an earlier question, he he certainly uh, expects that. Congress will extend the payroll tax cut, extend unemployment insurance, that uh, they will do that without drama uh, because it's the right thing to do. It's a, it's a tax cut for 160 million Americans, the kinds of thing that uh, Republicans, um, at least in theory, are supposed to be for. So uh, we, we, we expect that the President will be able to and will work to cooperate with Congress on a number of areas. And as I said earlier this week, you know, I, you know, we, we actually are, are fairly uh, hopeful about the prospect of greater cooperation um, because, uh, you know, not just the President is running for re-election, but uh, all of the House and a third of the Senate, and you know, everybody has to answer to their constituents. And uh, I think constituents uh, to members of Congress are going to want to know what their elected representatives did and what actions they took beyond obstruction to help the economy grow and create jobs. And then can I get your reaction on the um, appointments to the National Labor Relations Board? Mm -hmm. Uh, Mitt Romney said today that the president has now packed it with union stooges. Um, And he said that the board's actions are simply un-American and what the president did was political payback for the unions helping him with his campaign. Uh, Well, I would make two points. First of all, uh, there were three nominees. One of them was a Republican who's been languishing Uh, hadn't even gotten a committee vote for a year. Secondly, um, I I find it a little rich uh, that uh, on this and on the uh, appointment of Richard Cordray to be the nation's consumer watchdog, uh, that the former governor of Massachusetts decided to take a position in both cases uh, against uh, the security and protection of 
working and middle class Americans. I mean, because the, the president made those recess appointments to the NLRB because the NLRB did not have enough members anymore to function. And it's an agency, an independent agency, that is designed to uh, protect workers' rights. The president thinks that's important. He thinks it's important to protect workers' rights. He thinks it's important in the case of the CFPB and Richard Cordray to protect consumers from uh, the abuses of payday lenders or mortgage, uh, non-bank mortgage brokers or student loan organizations or uh, uh, businesses. So uh, that's my comment on that. Ken. Uh, Jay, in the new uh, defense cuts, the strategic review, uh, one of the areas to escape the ax is the East Asia Pacific region. <coughs> is there uh, a way that, that how, how should China perceive that? Is, is this being done uh, largely with China in mind? It's an excellent question. As you heard the President make clear uh, during his Asia trip, uh, APEC, East Asia Summit, uh, in November, the, uh, the President is committed to rebalancing our focus, both in our national security and defense strategies, on uh, Asia. Uh, the President's position as a candidate, as well as uh, since he's been in office, was that uh, for because of the uh, intense focus on Iraq, uh, principally, uh, as, as well as the Middle East in general, that uh, followed 9-11, uh, we had, uh, as a nation, not been paying enough attention to Asia. Uh, and that uh, is broadly the case and broadly the President's view with regard to uh, the economics, diplomacy, uh, as well as uh, foreign policy and national security. So uh, he made clear that uh, in this defense strategy uh, review that uh, he insisted on it and he was deeply engaged in it and met with uh, Secretary of Defense and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs as well as the combatant commanders because he wanted a strategy to drive the choices that were made around the budget, not the other way around, not because there were budget cuts passed into law by the Budget Control Act, uh, voted on in a bipartisan way, uh, that, uh, that that number shouldn't drive our defense strategy, but a strategy that didn't be uh, uh, developed that was best for the country, best for our uh, future, and, 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 that the, and, and then the, uh, the budget would address that. So his commitment to, uh, as you said, you know, sort of maintaining our presence and uh, uh, and even uh, heightening it in Asia is part of that overall rebalancing. Yes, and then Jessica, you. sorry. Um, what message might this send to North Korea, and is there any concern that uh, this, this new focus on Asia might be provoking in any way this new untested leader? And then domestically on the same issue, um, defense companies are talking about losing hundreds of jobs, potentially thousands, as a result of these uh, defense cuts. Mm -hmm. What do you say to that? Uh, uh, as regards North Korea and, and, and the change in leadership there, I mean, obviously that, that, that's a, a recent development and, and the President's uh, focus on Asia and, and his uh, goal of rebalancing our, our, uh, our, our strategic view towards Asia, Asia long predates that. Uh, so there's no relation there and our, our, our position on North Korea uh, remains as it was. On the issue of budget cuts, uh, these are uh, the product of a bipartisan bill, the Budget Control Act, that was passed, as you know, uh, in August. And, and uh, um, the fact of the matter is that after 9-11, uh, for good reason, our defense budget uh, increased uh, uh, rather dramatically and for uh, a sustained period of time. And, and, and over the past three years, our uh, our, our defense budget has been increasing. So, um, you know, we are making sensible choices uh, that uh, reflect our need to get our fiscal house in order, and we are making those choices driven by a strategy rather than just giving the Defense Department an across-the-board haircut, because that would be irresponsible. We're, we're uh, eliminating old Cold War programs to ensure that we can uh, enhance our investment in uh, intelligence, reconnaissance, and and, and other areas that are, are more suited for modern-day uh, defense strategy. So uh, 
there's no question that there are, there are difficult choices involved in this, but, but the fact of the matter is that even with these cuts, our budget, defense budget will be uh, substantial and, and, and larger even than it was towards the end of the Bush administration. Yes, Jessica. You touched on this in the gaggle yesterday, but I wanted to just press you a little further. Um, but quoting some of the things the President said as Senator mm -hmm. when he opposed John Bolton's uh, recess appointment, he said it's the wrong thing to do, and he said this process means we'll have less credibility and ironically be less equipped, in this case, to reform the United Nations. Mm -hmm. Now, I know in the gaggle you said that was he opposed it because he didn't like John Bolton's policies, but in this case, he likes Cordray's policies. How does this go to the substance of the matter, which is the recess sure, the, appointment itself? Well, the point I was making, again, I, I think I cited uh, the statistics on recess appointments, which is a constitutional authority allowed to every president and which has been exercised by the pre this president's mm -hmm. predecessors in far greater degree. Uh, secondly, the distinction here is that as I've noted, Richard Cordray has broad bipartisan support. There is no question about his qualifications for this job. In the case of Mr. Bolton, there were uh, a great many questions about the quali his qualifications for the job and a great, uh, a great deal of opposition to his nomination uh, on the merits, on his qualifications, and that, and that makes this quite different. This is a, a, uh, an effort to deny Richard Cordray uh, the opportunity to to serve in this position because of opposition to the position itself and opposition to Wall Street reform, uh, not because of opposition to this nominee. And the fact is, CFPB exists because it is the law. The position exists because it is the law. It was passed by the House and the Senate. It was signed into law by the President. If Republicans want to change that, they can do it legislatively or they can try to. Uh, in the meantime, the nation's consumers deserve to have this consumer watchdog in place, and that's why the President acted as he did about some of the executive muscle he's been flexing lately. When he was a candidate in 2008, he railed against the executive powers that the Bush-Cheney White House um, had expanded. Mm -hmm. uh, but now he is, as I said, flexing a lot of executive muscle. Has he flip-flopped on that position? or? To well, look, I, think, I think there are apples and oranges here in terms of the, the, the use and uh, extent of executive authority, I would simply point to the stats I just gave you about recess appointments, which is a well-established uh, tradition and uh, authority granted by the Constitution to Presidents of the United States, an authority that this President has uh, used uh, discriminatingly uh, by comparison to uh, President Bush, for example. And, and, and going back to, this is not an either-or proposition. You don't decide simply act with your executive authority and, and not act with Congress, because uh, this President's committed to doing everything he can within his power to uh, help the American people to grow the economy and to create jobs. That's his number one priority. And uh, that includes working with Congress, because uh, on, on so many of these important issues, uh, Congress has to be part of the solution, has to be uh, part of the effort to cooperate. Well, I mean, he's, we have certainly experienced gridlock on some issues, and we've experienced a great deal of obstruction on the Richard Cordray nomination and, and other issues. But, uh, you know, he, he, execs he, he exercises his executive authority, I think, in a very judicious uh, manner. And, and as, as you and others have often pointed out, I mean, some of the things that he is able to do through his executive authority as regards, as relates to jobs in the economy, uh, are sometimes very small in their impact. Uh, but that doesn't mean they're not worth doing. And, and the fact is he will do things small, medium, and large uh, that he can do through his executive authority, that he can do working with the private sector as he did uh, today, or as the White House did today with the Summer Jobs Plus program. Uh, and then he will continue to press uh, the Congress to, to take action on, on the American Jobs Act and to take action broadly on jobs in the economy through the payroll ca tax cut extension, through the extension of unemployment insurance, through the uh, absolute urgent need to do something about our infrastructure as uh, a long-term economic growth matter and also as a way of putting idle construction workers back to work. I mean, that should be a goal that we all share. And traditionally, Republicans and Democrats have shared and have acted on. So uh, again, we remain hopeful that we can work with Congress, that we will work with Congress, uh, and, and that that cooperation will be uh, driven by the demands of the American people and the constituents, those folks who uh, sent uh, the members to Congress and sent the President to the Oval Office. 
Uh, Mark. Yeah, Jake, speaking of jobs, uh, tomorrow's jobs numbers, I know you're not in the predictions business. But can you talk about the... I'll throw it out there. Right, well, thank you. <laughs> Listen, if you're going to Vegas, you, you yeah. may as well do that, too. Um, what, can you talk about the, the, the hopes and the expectations, and specifically about the, the first jobs numbers of the year and how they might set the tone for what the president's going to speak about in the State of the Union speech and also what he says in the campaign trail in the months ahead. I, I, I wouldn't dare to go there. Um, what I can tell you is, as I've said before, that well, because it would it would it would sound like a prediction, and, and I, I just don't have one. So we look at these things as, and our economists look at these things as, as sort of longer term trends. One number uh, is not decisive, whether it's good or bad. Uh, what we are focused on, you know, we can't control the data, right? What we are focused on is what we can do. to help grow the economy, to help create jobs so that uh, that unemployment number comes down, so that the job creation number goes up, so that the growth number goes, goes up. But we can't uh, spend a lot of time worrying about what those numbers are going to be because we don't, we don't control that uh, directly. We, we can only do what we can do. And that's why we're, this president's so focused on doing everything he can from you know, summer jobs plus programs to helping folks uh, with their uh, mortgages to um, putting people back to work through the American Jobs Act. So, mm -hmm. logistical questions: A, are we going to hear from the president on the jobs uh, uh, jobs mm -hmm. numbers tomorrow? Are we going to hear from? Him? I don't. I don't have a scheduling announcement uh, to make. The other, the other question is: uh, the president's talked about wanting to get right to work on extending the payroll tax cuts. Mm -hmm. Are there negotiations already underway on getting the full year? Well, I, 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 I don't have any specifics for you. I'm, I'm sure that there are conversations being had, uh, but beyond that, I don't, I don't have any details. I mean, we certainly look forward to uh, that action being taken as, as soon as possible to ensure that there's no doubt uh, in the minds of the American people who would be affected by uh, the failure to extend the payroll tax cut uh, that the extension will happen. There's nothing involved in the White House right now. I, I don't have any details on that, no. Yeah. Jay, on recent appointments, uh, one earlier you said, I don't think anybody expects Washington to be a campfire where everyone sits around and sings Kumbaya. Mm -hmm. What about hope and change? I thought maybe there was an expectation the president said that if he got elected, maybe it wouldn't be singing around a campfire, sure. but um, that the situation would improve. Is he just giving well, up? I, th I think that, in some ways, I answered your question before I got it, which is that the, the, the president's promise was uh, not uh, just to change atmospherics, but, but to change the way Washington did business and to change it by, by, by working together collaboratively with Congress and others in Washington to get uh, people here to focus on challenges that they had ignored for too long, that we had ignored for too long. Uh, and that included uh, uh, the need for Wall Street reform, the need for health care reform, a, 100, a project 100 years in the making uh, that had experienced numerous uh, uh, efforts and failures, uh, the, the need to uh, deal with our uh, energy policy, to get it focused on um, uh, uh, all of the above approach in terms of our energy sources to reduce our dependence on foreign oil and to ensure that we were uh, competitive in the 21st century in clean energy industries and uh, doing things that helped our environment as well as helped our economy. Uh, you know, and, and he has done these, uh, saving the automobile industry, and, and, and because of the crisis, brought on in the automobile industry by the uh, devastating recession, uh, insisting at great political peril, as I'm sure you all reported on at the time, uh, that uh, we need to have a vibrant, thriving American automobile industry. He was not willing to write it off, and that, but in exchange for taxpayer assistance, insisting that those uh, companies reform themselves and make themselves more competitive. And, 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 and that's what he's done. So, and, he, and, and he didn't do it alone. He did it with Congress. Uh, in almost all cases. So, uh, you know, it, it is true that partisanship prevails still, and, 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 and the tone is not uh, what you would hope. But the important thing here for the American people is that uh, we change the way we do business, that we address the challenges that had loomed like uh, elephants in the room that everybody ignored. For, for too long, and that's what this president has done. Well, when you say change the way you do business, on the substance of, of uh, how recess appointments go forward, mm -hmm. you, you guys cited all kinds of legal, including Bush administration, and Bush, administration, Bush uh, we arguments, quoted right? quoted yesterday saying that you have the constitutional power to do this. <coughs> Nevertheless, when you say now, 
they're in recess. They're not working. Mm -hmm. Democrats, like Harry Reid, as recently as 2008, when George W. Bush was in office, mm -hmm. agreed with the Bush White House, which he was not friendly with, that when they're in pro forma session, um, then in, in fact, um, they're not in recess. They're open for business. They're not doing a lot. But there was an agreement that, that President Bush would not do, he did plenty of recess appointments, but when they were in pro forma session, he did not. He accepted that precedent. And, and Harry Reid, as recently as 2008, well, he was didn't, saying this. He didn't take advantage of, or he didn't act on the legal opinion of his own OLC and others who, who actually argued the opposite. Uh, so, but look, they, they, I think their opinions are quite clear, and I think you, you quoted one of them in your, in your piece. The, uh, look, our, our legal standing here we are very confident on, right. and on the absolute need to ensure that uh, the CFPB has its full authority and its powers to protect Americans, middle class consumers from dishonest uh, uh, non financial institutions. You know, we're, we're very comfortable with sure, that no, and the need to agree. act. But, but there was, when we talk about Kumbaya and all this, Harry Reid, who didn't like George W. Bush, called him a liar, all kinds of other things, agreed that when, when um, you know, that, that, that this was in place and that he would not do these recess appointments, and President Bush didn't defy that. So, how are you improving this toll that you're talking about when you're changing that gentleman's agreement that was in effect just you're, you're three You're talking about process here, on the, the one hand, on the one hand you're talking about whether, I mean, I, I, I defy you to find anything like a quorum, anything like, uh, you know, even a, enough people to fill this room and, you know, uh, up on Capitol Hill who are elected members of Congress. You might find them uh, in very warm places or snowy places having fundraisers, but you won't find them in Capitol Hill because they are in recess. And, uh, you know, we can't wait for a, a process that has proven itself to be broken to fix itself. And with regards to uh, the President's constitutional authority, which you've said uh, he has, uh, he's going to exercise it because we have to have Richard Cordray in place in order to protect American consumers. Um, you know, and, and the argument against that is either, on, on the other side, is either a process argument or uh, more, more truthfully, is, is, is an argument about the fact that they don't even want the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and they, and they want to weaken it or water it down or eliminate it, because they seem to believe that after all we went through in 2007 and 2008, you know, the, the unbelievable harm that the financial crisis caused to this economy and to the American people, that we don't need new rules. Wall Street should go back to the way it was. The financial institutions should be to regulate themselves. Uh, I, they can, they, can, they can take that out on the road and try and sell it, but I don't think there are going to be many buyers. Well, last thing on that point, you said that several times in this briefing and other places, that basically the Republicans just want to do away with They don't have a problem with Richard Cordray as a man. They think, they keep, they I'm just quoting them. And, and they have said that. It's absolutely true. However, Republicans do have a substantive point they make on this that you're not mentioning, which is that he has an office with $500 million, and they think that it's unaccountable and that there should be oversight of that. So he's not just going after businesses. Do you at least agree? that there should be some safeguards in place. There should be consumer protections, but there should also be protections to make sure he doesn't have $500 million. But Ed, as you know, fishing the, the, the kind of oversight that exists for the CFPB BB is no different than as exists for other independent agencies, by and large. It is part of the law that was passed uh, and signed into law by the President. And, and if they want to introduce changes to the structure or oversight of the CFPB through legislation, they, they should do that. Uh, but they should not block a highly qualified nominee for a job that exists in law out of ideological peak, because it's hurting the American people. And it's certainly not doing them any good, I think, politically. But that's just my advice. Yes? Uh, if the President were to go ahead, were planning to go ahead with a controversial recess appointment, why didn't he just appoint the person who invented the office to begin with, Elizabeth Warren? That's a golden oldie. Um, I think she's running for Senate. <laughs> she wouldn't be running for Senate if the President had made a recess. Well, I, I don't know about that. I mean, I think, look, we have enormous regard for Elizabeth Warren. She did a terrific job in setting up this agency. Uh, Richard Cordray is, as she herself has said, uh, the right man for the job, the right person for the job, and enormously qualified. And, uh, uh, you know, and, and as I mentioned at the top, she's, uh, I think, engaged in a, uh, a campaigner of her own right now. So. Did you guys give her a heads up that you were going to do the recess appointment for Cordray? 
Uh, I don't. I don't. I don't believe so. But you uh, can get rid of courtesy call that you were recessing appointing someone else. She's running for Senate, Hans. A courtesy call? No, no, I don't believe well, we did. She just set up this agency. It was her baby. Hans, I don't believe we did. Wait, mate, uh, just, just one more question. There seems to be some legal question whether Richard Cordray can be paid because if it's a recess appointment. Do you know whether or not he'll actually be paid? I, 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 I assume, as with other recess appointments, he, he has all the uh, uh, everything that comes with it, um, but I don't have a specific okay. uh, answer to that. It's a shocking allegation that uh, there were fundraisers in warm and snowy places going on around the country. I'm just <laughs> guessing. Republicans. Is the implication that just because Congress isn't here in session that only they're not in Washington, working? Only in Washington would uh, not being in the office, not even being in the town where your office sure. exists, uh, qualify as being on the job. I mean, Congress, if Congress is in session, they're supposed to be, you know, somewhere like close to the Capitol. So, uh, look, I, you know, train your cameras on the chambers. See if you can find any they folks. Don't, they don't let our cameras in. Well, you I take your point. <laughs> <laughs> That's I wonder why, right? <laughs> well, at length about the fact that the frustration that, Richard, that long. Richard Cordray over the course of two years that Richard Cordray was being bottled up and held up by the Senate, mm -hmm. unwilling to approve his, even vote on his nomination. The two of the three NLRB nominees were just um, put forth last month, just mm -hmm. a few weeks ago. The Senate hasn't had time to act on them. What's the justification for a recess appointment well, for them? We need the agency to function so that workers' rights continue to be Protected. It's an independent agency that cannot function without a certain number of board members. One. Two, I, any doubt about the Senate's intention or the Republicans in the Senate's intention of allowing any nominee to come forward can be, was demonstrated by the fact that they wouldn't even allow the Republican nominee to get to a committee vote, So, who had been there for almost a year. So uh, the President acted because Congress wouldn't, and, and it was clear that Congress wouldn't, and no, numerous senators have made clear they won't. And uh, uh, we have to have that. Uh, these independent agencies exist for a reason, and and uh, the president believed that it was uh, essential to make sure that that agency could function. Well, I have two follow-ups to that. The first is, if it's so critical for the agency to function, everybody knew when those vacancies were coming. Why didn't the president nominate somebody earlier so the Senate would have time to confirm them in a, should they be so inclined in a timely fashion? Well, I think he was hoping that the uh, Senate would confirm the Republican who had been up there for a long time. There was, I think, a Democrat who had, uh, was recess appointed who was available, you know, who they, they refused to confirm in the past. So, again, the Senate's, uh, Senate Republicans' disposition towards this could not have been more clear, and, and their intentions could not have been more clear. So, and the fact is, it was a simply a matter of the agency could not act and function without having uh, the requisite number of board members. So the standard for the Senate bottling somebody up is now statements by senators about their intentions, to whether they plan well, or don't plan to move I mean, on. You, you know how Congress works. I mean, I, maybe there should be a day where, for example, with the filibuster, senators actually have to hang around and filibuster, properly act out the verb, right? And uh, uh, But instead, all they have to do is, like, tug on their ear and suddenly a vote goes down. So uh, unfortunately, that's how it works. Uh, so we, you know, I, I, Laura, I we, we could have a, I think at, at the, uh, out of uh, deference to your colleagues, you know, we can we can we can have this uh, esoteric conversation later. But I think the president, uh, I think with clear justification, uh, believed that he had to do this in order to ensure that this independent agency could function. Toshi, thank you, Jay. Next week's Treasury Secretary Gaino will go to Japan, China. I'm not going to ask about the details, but uh, can you give us a sen sense of uh, general expectation by the administration? administration on his visit and on potential de deliverables? Well, no, I won't talk about uh, deliverables. I mean, this is uh, part of uh, his responsibilities as, as Treasury Secretary. I don't believe he's been to China since uh, last spring. Uh, I could be wrong about that, but I think it's roughly that. And, and uh, this is you know, part of our engagement with Asia that we've talked about already, uh, and in the case of Japan, an important ally. So. Uh, but I don't have any more details on it. Maybe Treasury does. Yes. Uh, we're approaching the one-year anniversary of the Gabby Giffords shooting. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, she's, of course, going to do things this weekend and market in a certain way. And, you know, when the President spoke and gave that really moving and, you know, by a lot of uh, accounts speech, 
Uh, he talked about uh, taking steps on gun safety and gun control in the months ahead. Um, does he have plans of actually following through on that a year later? Well, I think we uh, did. We publish that. I, I think we we, we have uh, put forward uh, some uh, uh, some positions on this, and and uh, I don't have anything new for you on it. Um, and I, I don't have anything for you on on the anniversary itself. It obviously was a. Uh, I mean, it's a solemn occasion, given that I mean it's a remarkable recovery that Congresswoman Giffords has made. But um, we can never forget uh, the lives lost on that day. Yes. Jay, I President's defense initiative that he announced today. Will the United States still have the ability or not have the ability to fight and win two major wars at the same time in different places? I, I, I believe Secretary Panetta, uh, following the President, uh, spoke at length uh, about the broader uh, defense strategy and, and the um, what underlies it. So I would uh, point you to his remarks uh, for a, a, a better assessment of that. The United States would be able to do more than one thing at a time. Uh, well, that's without question. But I guess the question is, does that include fighting and winning two major wars at the same time? Um, look, what I can say is, again, I, you should, I think there is ample uh, comment on this from the Secretary of Defense uh, about uh, what um, the strategy is and, and, and what it allows our military forces to achieve. Uh, what is true is that we are uh, at the end of a decade of war. Uh, just when this president took office, we had 180,000 troops in Iraq and Afghanistan, and we're now down to half that. And the president is, as you know, as part of his Afghanistan strategy, committed to further drawing down Afghan forces gradually. Uh, and, and that uh, creates opportunities and, and allows us to rebalance uh, our uh, defense strategy, uh, but for, for details about how that uh, is underpinned, if you will, I would point you to the Secretary of Defense. Thanks, Jay. Yeah. We, are Sorry. you guys willing to acknowledge that you're working with Yusuf Karagawi on the peace talks with the uh, Taliban? I, I, I don't have any information on that. Uh, Mark, I feel like I owe you one. You raise your hand for a bit. Thanks. Um, based on White House Counsel's legal analysis, if the Senate had come into pro forma session every day instead of every three or four days, would that have made a difference? Uh, I will leave it to the lawyers to analyze it or, or to provide further detail for you on it. The, um, our assessment is that uh, Congress has been in recess and has made every indication that it will be in recess for a sustained period of time and that gaveling in and gaveling out for seven seconds does not constitute a recess uh, with regard to the president's constitutional authority. I mean, let's let's take the other. I guess going to maybe Laura's question or somebody else's. The other the other side of the extreme here, which is that if these gimmicks were all a Senate needed to the Senate needed to do to prevent the president from exercising his constitutional authority, any president, then no Senate would e I mean, no president would ever be able to exercise well, it because in the last but, two years of the Bush. Well, uh, but, and we're saying that, that this is a gimmick versus a constitutionally enshrined authority. And we feel uh, very comfortable as a legal matter <clears throat> uh, that uh, Constitution trumps gimmicks. Thanks. And it has the White House.